This Week on The Communicators, a discussion on efforts by technology and human rights organizations to protect free speech around the world. Our guest is Michael Samway, a vice president for Yahoo. This week on The Communicators, we are uh, pleased to have join us Michael Samway of Yahoo, who serves as their vice president and deputy general counsel. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, Pedro. And helping us in the conversation for today, Julian Sanchez of the website Ars Technica. He serves as their Washington editor. Mr. Sanchez, a welcome to you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Samway, just to get people familiar with uh, your position at Yahoo, uh, your title says vice president, deputy general counsel, but specifically you deal in, in global affairs. Can you give us a sense of what you do as far as the company is concerned? Sure, thank you. I have two principal roles. I help lead our international legal team, so we're about 75 lawyers located throughout the world, in the Americas, Europe, and across Asia. And then my, my job that is really my passion at Yahoo is leading our business and human rights program. And that's about building capacity at Yahoo to make responsible decisions around human rights issues. Our challenge at Yahoo, I think, is, is well known uh, publicly and, and has been told many times in the press. What we have tried to do is learn from the lessons, the tough lessons that we've gone through at Yahoo, and really take concrete steps to make responsible decisions around human rights. We've tried to fuse business decision making with human rights analysis. And to do that, we've taken a number of steps, including creating a business and human rights program. This is the program that I lead today mm -hmm. uh, that is really about building infrastructure in the company, senior leadership, a cross-functional team, that thinks about human rights issues, that looks at business decisions through the lens of human rights. Now, the Business and Human Rights Program has a number of pillars. And I, the first pillar is executive commitment. This is true in any business about any product, sales, business line. You have to have a commitment from the top and have to set the tone from the top. It's also critical that you understand that the heartbeat and the pulse in any company really comes from the employees. So we also engage closely with our employees around human rights issues. That's the first pillar of the Business and Human Rights Program. And when you're dealing with these intersections, you're dealing with countries, particularly as countries with pretty repressive uh, histories of human rights, and particularly when it comes to technology issues. Is that correct? That's correct. And I think you see in the areas of risk, so you identified what some of the risks are, mm -hmm. certain governments around the world don't always uh, protect the fundamental human rights of their own citizens. The other side of that coin is there, there's great opportunity. And one of the reasons uh, that we've focused so hard on human rights uh, within the company is that we know that on our own, we can make important strides. But we also know that the real strength in combating challenges to human rights lies in collective power and working with others. And that's why we've launched uh, together with a number of human rights groups, other companies, academics, and socially responsible investors, the Global Network Initiative. And if you had to sum it up in a couple of sentences, what is this initiative? The Global Network Initiative is a collective, collaborative, and I would say even pioneering approach to protecting and advancing freedom of expression and privacy. A little bit of background on, on the process. We've spent two intensive years working closely with human rights groups, prominent among them Human Rights First, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights in China, Committee to Protect Journalists, two of our, our major industry counterparts, uh, so in addition to Yahoo, Google, and Microsoft, uh, prominent academics, including at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a number of socially responsible investors, all facilitated by Center for Democracy and Technology here in Washington and Business for Social Responsibility mm -hmm. uh, in San Francisco. This group has worked intensively to create really a framework, a roadmap for how companies can work together with these other groups to combat challenges to free expression and privacy. There are three core components uh, to the Global Network Initiative. The first is a set of high-level principles. So these principles really set out the foundations uh, of free expression and privacy, starting with uh, a reference to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right. which is going to celebrate its 60th anniversary on uh, December 10th, so just a few weeks away. The second core component is a set of implementation guidelines, which is really about defining what companies can do on their own and then working with others to take concrete steps to protect free expression and privacy. Include things like conducting human rights impact analyses, mm -hmm. include setting up 
core teams at companies with senior leadership and includes an internal uh, accountability framework that will be uh, something that, that uh, a governance board is going to, to uh, operate and, um, and also report on publicly. Mm -hmm. The third component really is, is this last point I mentioned. That's an accountability framework that is about a governance entity, about independent assessment and evaluation of the companies, and then public reporting, reporting to, to the world, really our most important stakeholders, this is true at Yahoo and true for the other company, are our users, the ordinary citizens around the world who have this great potential, this great opportunity to access more information, to learn more about really issues impacting their own lives, and then to communicate, whether it's across villages or across national borders. We'll flesh those out as we go along, but uh, let's let Julian Sanchez into the conversation. Sure. Uh, so before I, when I uh, put on my skeptical journalist hat, I do want to say it's extraordinarily heartening to see uh, so many major companies not only uh, centering these these issues, but also doing it collaboratively. Um, but I, I, uh, I am curious, one of the, the potential weak spots in uh, the in the principles of lead out seem, is that there seems to be an asymmetry between retrospective and prospective approaches. It seems to be there's, there's a greater burden on entering new markets uh, uh, to, to ensure that uh, there's compliance for the principles then to sort of revise the state of affairs in markets where there's already a presence. So it seems on the one hand as though um, that means these, these, these principles end up having a disparate impact on companies that already have a significant global presence. And as sort of a follow-up to that, I'm, I'm wondering how you sort of split the difference between bringing in more companies that would be more burdened by this sort of prospective obligation. Uh, in particular, I think of Skype, which I know uh, seems to have greeted the GNI uh, a, bit, a bit coolly because it's looking to branch into China right now. So thank you for the questions. Let me take them in reverse order. Sure. There's clear power in numbers. There's strength in numbers. Collectively, we can do more things. There's no question. There are three, I think, foundational beliefs of the group of companies, human rights groups, academics, and investors. The first is the sanctity of human rights. We all made common cause on that uh, very clearly. That would, there was no tension in, in, in that discussion. The second foundational belief is that Trans, uh, technology can be transformational. Technology can improve people's lives. The internet, to focus on one aspect of technology, can help societies modernize, can help grease the wheels of an economy, can help people communicate in ways uh, not thought of, not, not fathomed uh, only five or ten years ago. The third fundamental belief, and this is returning to my first point, is that there's strength in numbers. So to answer your question about other companies, we clearly want other companies to join. We need other companies. These are global principles. They apply across the world. They apply even beyond the internet sector. We need companies like telecommunications companies, software companies, hardware companies. You mentioned one. We certainly are stronger, more powerful, and can have more influence if we have a greater number of companies. That's been uh, part of the plan throughout. We've been recruiting uh, together with human rights groups, with academics, with investors, other companies. We hope that we'll develop something, really a system that becomes, in a sense, the gold standard uh, and almost a certification that people want to have. We want people to join. We don't want companies to think we're only joining this to avoid a problem. We want companies to join because this is a real avenue to help resolve problems. And to get to your, your first question about uh, whether this is only prospective, I think technically, um, if, you, if you look at the documents, you'll see that it actually does apply, apply retrospect, retrospectively. But I'd also note, having been um, a, a member of the discussions over two years, that we have discussed the very question that you raised, which is how does this apply to markets where you're already doing business? It absolutely does apply. These standards and the implementation guidelines, for example, are not just about the next wave of markets in the Middle East and in South Asia and in former Soviet republics. They're about existing markets. Now, without question, our focus is on those markets where the greatest challenges arise, where there is less mature, less developed rule of law. But certainly, the principles do apply. They apply globally. They apply to businesses we have today. And again, there is incredible strength in numbers. We are, I think, as I said, pioneering. It's an organic effort. 
We believe it has real teeth, but also that it's going to grow. It's going to change not only with changing geopolitics, but with this incredibly dynamic changing technology that is the Internet. How do you envision then making these principles practicals, practical in a, in a place like China, where you already have existing business? Well, one of the foundational uh, issues is that companies are required to comply with local laws. And that's true in the United States, and it's true outside the United States. It's true for Yahoo, and it's true for the other companies. It's true for the human rights groups. Any organization must comply with local laws. The real question is, what are you going to do to either fight for change or to ensure that local governments are actually upholding their own laws? And again, this is where we can turn to the collective power. This is something where, on our own, we can have a certain amount of influence, and it's important that we do exert that influence. And at Yahoo, we've started by building our own internal capacity, but we've also done other things. We've created a human rights fund with a noted human rights activist uh, and former uh, uh, prisoner in the Lao Gai system in China, Mr. Harry Wu. We have also created academic fellowships on the West Coast at Stanford, on the East Coast here in Washington at Georgetown University to promote scholarship on the issue. We have advocated for the release of dissidents, working closely with the State Department. Those are individual steps, but working collectively, we have enormous power, working with the human rights firsts of the world, uh, working with the brain power that, they, that the Berkman Center at Harvard brings to the table. We can come up with constructive solutions that really have the weight of the thoughtfulness and the experience of the human rights groups, and really the business sense, the knowledge on the ground that the companies bring and working in these systems. So does that mean that if the Chinese government finds a dissident or someone talking about atrocities, puts it up on a website, they come looking to Yahoo for information about personal information, does that mean Yahoo doesn't turn over this information? Well, let me begin by noting that Yahoo sold uh, the Yahoo China business to Alibaba in 2005. So we don't have operational control, but we have exerted our influence on Alibaba. We're a 40% investor. In this Chinese company. Is that still done under the Yahoo moniker, though, if someone in China, or is it under Alibaba? If, if someone goes to the website, will they still see Yahoo? There still is a Yahoo China. It's a, a very good question. And what we have done, and this is independent of the collective action that I think we'll be able to, to take under the Global Network Initiative, is exerted our influence on Alibaba. And let me give two examples of where we have done that. The first is with respect to a search uh, results notice. At the bottom, of the search page at, on Yahoo China, users know that certain results do not appear as a result of Chinese law. On the mail registration page for Yahoo China Mail, there is a clear notice that says that this service is subject to Chinese law. Again, what we must do as companies is continue to exert our influence. What we feel like we can do together is do it in a more effective, meaningful, and powerful way. But at the end of the day, it's governments that have the most leverage, the most authority, the most power to make meaningful change in other governments. And that's where we have uh, turned to the U.S. government in our case, and other companies have been able to turn to other governments to help in advocacy. The government has many tools in its toolbox, including bilateral and multilateral forums, traditional diplomacy, trade. The U.S. government, uh, through the State Department, launched in 2006 something called GIFT, Global Internet Freedom Task Force, and we've partnered with the State Department uh, at Yahoo mm -hmm. to really try to take advantage of the access that they have to high-level officials, whether it's, it's advocating for the release of dissidents or it's promoting Internet freedom in their annual country reports and having a section on Internet freedom. We believe that it's governments, really, who can influence rule of law change and can influence other governments respect their own citizens' human rights. Mr. Sanchez. Well, so, I mean, let's talk concretely then. Uh, I mean, one, one of the cases that I think got the most attention that Yahoo was involved in was that of Xitao in, in China, um, who was essentially imprisoned on the basis of information the government was able to uh, secure from, from Yahoo Mail. What would prevent that from happening tomorrow? What, what steps have been taken uh, to ensure that there isn't another Xitao next week? Well, let me begin because this, by noting that we understand, I think, deeply at Yahoo that this is not just a technology issue, this is not just a legal issue, this is a human issue. And we have met with Chateau's family 
Um, we have met with the families of other dissidents, uh, including as recently as last week when I met with the wife of one of the dissidents. We take these issues very seriously. We learned a lot of tough lessons, and we are trying to take concrete steps to minimize the risks in this area. And as I mentioned, collectively, we have much greater power uh, to help advocate for change in places like China, but in other places where governments don't always respect the rights of their own citizens. In the case of Shitao, we also understand that we have a responsibility to help advocate for his release. And we've done that. We've, we've been at the State Department. Our own co-founder and CEO, uh, Jerry Yang, has, has been vocal on this. And I've met with him uh, with senior officials in the State Department. And you may recall that he wrote a letter to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice mm -hmm. uh, advocating uh, for renewed vigor. Uh, we, can, we expect to continue uh, the same advocacy and connection uh, to encourage the government uh, uh, to, to try to secure the release of Chateau and other dissidents. We, we hope to, to maintain the same relationship with the Obama administration and really continue uh, to have them advocate for the release. And again, we care deeply about the issue. We've learned a lot of tough lessons, but we're trying to take concrete steps inside the company. There's a lot we can do on our own, but there's even more we can do working with others. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the incoming President-elect Obama administration. Last year, there was a hearing on this very issue, uh, Tom Lantos and others uh, questioning Mr. Yang about these issues. Is there a concern that by that hearing and an incoming administration that legislatively things might be done in Washington to prevent that kind of thing from happening as far as the offering of information uh, to other governments? And if that's the case, is this initiative kind of a, a step to circumvent that or at least stop that process from happening legislatively? The Global Network Initiative is not a silver bullet, but it is an enormous step in the right direction. Our sense in the initiative, and this is not just from Yahoo, Google, and Microsoft, uh, I, I think this comes really in the collaborative efforts of the mainstream uh, human rights groups, uh, some of the, the most prominent human rights advocates, some of our toughest critics, frankly, uh, are a part of this initiative. And I, I, I will only speak for Yahoo here, but I believe uh, there's a general sense that a collective initiative like the one that we've launched, the Global Network Initiative, really has the greatest opportunity uh, to create meaningful change. It's what can change behavior not only in companies but potentially in governments around the world. Again, there's strength in numbers. We support uh, the principles behind and certainly the objectives of legislation uh, and, and proposals that we've seen here in Washington, D.C. Some would make it a crime for uh, the offering of information. I know there was a bill I, I considered, I think, sometime last year. If I'm correct, uh, that would kind of do that kind of thing. You and, would support that effort? And, and I, so part of our, our congressional interaction has included uh, close engagement with, with many uh, of, of the members uh, on the Hill and, and senators. Um, I testified in May before a Senate hearing. And one of the things I think that we've been very clear about that is important and, again, I think reflects the view uh, of other companies who are participants is that meaningful legislation certainly has an important role. But legislation that puts companies in the impossible position of having to choose between violating local law and violating U.S. law isn't sustainable. It's not a tenable position for companies to be in. And then what happens is companies will make the decision really, it's, and, and there's no other option, to withdraw from the market. And that goes back to one of the foundational beliefs that I mentioned, I think, in the Global Network Initiative. And that is that information is power. It is empowering. The Internet can be an important force for good, and we want it to be a force for good. It's done incredible things in a number of markets. There are risks, clearly. I don't want to understate um, the risks that come along with it. That's really why we're here. But the incredible opportunity is phenomenal. People are learning more about their own lives, learning more about job opportunities, learning more about local corruption, learning more about health issues, environmental issues, learning more about the outside world than they ever have. And it's really been uh, exponentially increasing with the Internet. That is enormous power. That is ultimately likely to be the most disruptive power in a repressive regime. And that's why we think it's better to be engaged. It's better to continue to offer these services and legislation that really puts us in the position of having to withdraw from that market really doesn't serve the ordinary citizens mm. of these local markets. 
Is there ever a point, though? I mean, in a way, this is the, the Milton Friedman Pinochet question. Is there ever a point where you say, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just too bad the use of this technology as an, an architecture of control is uh, too great and, you know, the, the thing to do is just not, not get involved at all? Is there, is there ever a point where you, where you need to say, you know, the, the, the balance is too, is too far? Well, yeah. sort of taking it philosophically, there, the fundamentals are unbendable. We don't bend on the fundamentals of human rights. There is a sanctity and that we all agree in in the Global Network Initiative among companies, human rights groups, academics, investors, and others. We don't bend on those. We also understand that it's much more complex. Take a number of, of um, examples, China as one, Vietnam as others, where the U.S. Congress, the U.S. government, has normalized trade relations, has encouraged companies and technology companies in particular to engage in markets. Yahoo was a pioneer in many of these international markets. Remember, we're a young company, but we grew very quickly outside of the U.S. We've been in many markets before there was a roadmap. What the Global Network Initiative does is it really gives us a roadmap. If I could take it to a sort of a seaside analogy, it gives us a chart. You have, you have your, uh, on your chart, you have your lighthouses and you have your shoals and you have your reefs. You also have a compass and you have the North Star and you have, and you have other things to guide you. They don't tell you where to go, they tell you where you are. And then you plot your course. That's what the Global Network Initiative does for us. It says, here are the dangers, but here's how we can get there together. Here's how we can plot the course to avoid the reef, to avoid the shoal, and sail together. So to continue this analogy, I mean, one of the places on the map where it might read, here there be monsters, uh, is, is a place, uh, or a thing you mentioned earlier, which is the, the problem of partners in some of these countries where, uh, again, the, the same language is repeated in the, in the principles that uh, companies lack operational control. And it seems like this is the place where you might end up seeing something like this sort of extraordinary rendition of data, where uh, we're not doing anything uh, awry, but we don't control them. And if, if they decide to do something terrible, uh, we, can't, we can't be uh, accountable. Beyond exerting influence, are there, are there particular restrictions that you want to enforce? on uh, existing partners or new partners going forward in terms of restricting the data that you're willing to share with them? Well, I think you raise really one of the, the great challenges in the Global Network Initiative, and that is how do you exert your influence on partners? So the first question is how do you define partners? Are we talking about commercial partners, financial investments, joint ventures, something where you really do run the company um, and someone else has an investment with you? That's a challenge that we all face. But exerting influence that's really proportionate with your level of involvement and your level of control is the key to it. You have to exert your influence if you're a company that's part of the Global Network Initiative on the partner. Are there concrete things you can do? Well, they start with the principles and then move down into the implementation guidelines. If sharing data is one of the enormous challenges uh, when you're in operating with a partner in a repressive regime, then it's critical that you analyze that decision. And this is my point originally. Look at it through a human rights lens. It's not just a technology question, it's a human question. So you have to make those decisions really with a view towards human rights. And that's what we're doing at Yahoo by creating the business and human rights program and really having a number of pillars that guide exactly what people are gonna do. There's an operational, there's a, a high level set of principles, an operational set of guidelines, for example, we will, where, uh, where we conduct analysis uh, and, and are in a situation of having disclosed data, make sure that governments are following their own laws. Where they're not, we'll challenge, uh, if all the circumstances make sense, and work with others to do it, challenge that government. We also are going to conduct a human rights impact analysis, not just on new markets, but in challenging places, we're going to do a human rights analysis on the relationship that we have existing. So I think that, as I mentioned before, some of this is organic. We're going to learn. This is the beginning, not the end. The Global Network Initiative has accomplished a lot. There will be concrete changes uh, on day one, the day after we launched on October 29th. But much of this is going to come from the collaborative effort of all of us working together. Just to reinstate the principles uh, that you can find on the website, uh, Global Initiative, uh, globalnetworkinitiative.org, uh, to boil it down to three, it's to respect and protect freedom of expression by avoiding or minimizing impact of uh, government restrictions, 
Companies will employ protections with respect to personal information in all countries where they operate. Participants will adhere to a determined governance structure. Again, this is a boil down of uh, the many principles there. You said challenge. Do you mean a legal challenge? Do you mean a diplomatic challenge? How do you challenge a government? And what footing do you have to challenge governments? So you, you give two good examples. So in repressive regimes and in regimes around the world, because this is a global process and really the principles have global application, the question is what tools do you have and what influence can you exert? Some of it may be through the courts. <coughs> I think that's a, that's a natural uh, way to challenge. Some of it may be through diplomatic efforts, either directly in that government or with the company's own home government. Some of it may be through, and this is outlined in some detail in the implementation guidelines of the initiative, through collective advocacy. It may be a question of companies coming together, again, strength in numbers, not just on their own, they're clearly more powerful than each is on its own, but also with human rights groups also with academics, but getting a sense of really what's most effective. Because at the end of the day, the question of challenging is really about what's the end result? How do we get to our common cause? Because we do have common cause with the human rights groups, the academics, the investors. That is to protect and promote free expression of privacy. I, I thought I saw actually one other method of challenging uh, in a case I wrote about a little while back involving court orders in Argentina uh, requiring certain public figures to be filtered out of search results. And it reminded me of it. There's a classic Czech anti-war novel called Good Soldier, Soldier Sveik. And it's about this soldier who uh, kind of hyper-literally interprets all his superior officer's uh, commands in a way that uh, utterly frustrates the, the war effort. And it seemed that the way Yahoo responded to these orders was so Diego Maradona uh, had a ruling saying he, his name couldn't be uh, used to yield any uh, defamatory search results. You just had a, an absolute block on the search string Diego Maradona. So if you search for Diego Maradona, you don't, you don't get a filtered anything. You just get, you know, the, the, the courts have required us not to give you any results. Uh, but also, if you search for Maradona Diego or Maradona or any number of other combinations, uh, you, you, in fact, get the full results. So it was a, a, a very literal and, and, and narrow and extreme interpretation, um, sort of a, a work to rule. And I, I thought that was, that was rather clever. Um, and I, I'm wondering if, if that's the kind of thing that you, you can see applying in other contexts. Well, this, is, this is actually a very nice test case. And it sort of steps back, I think, from some of the polarizing regions of the world into a Western democracy. And I have to say at the outset that I have great respect, uh, having lived for a number of years and worked for a number of years in Latin America sure. for the Argentine judicial system and, and legal profession. In this case, to give a little background, we have nearly 100 lawsuits filed by the same lawyer to limit search results uh, for his clients. And as you described, some of those limitations include very clearly a list of pages, websites, photos, but also, as you noted, some very broad uh, requests, such as, please remove all scandalous material. Please remove anything that appears to be defamatory. So what we have done, and Google is also involved in this process, and we've worked with them collaboratively on this, is challenged these lawsuits. We have received, in response, temporary orders, essentially injunctions, temporary restraining orders from the local judges saying, until the case is finally adjudicated, this is what you have to do. We have fought those orders. We have fought those interim orders and still lost. We have challenged them and lost. So now our response has been to comply with the law, to tell our users what we're doing, but to continue to find collaborative ways to address the issue. I just spent last Friday morning at the State Department working with uh, a number of people there who we think are going to help us. There are other methods. I know that you've written on it, and I saw your very thoughtful piece uh, on the issue. Others have written on it. The Open Net Initiative, I think, brought a, a lot of the important issues to light. And what we hope to do is really, again, go back to strength in numbers, get the collective involved, and try to ultimately help change what happens on the ground. Because what's happening on the ground is really the application of a law that was meant to apply to an industry that, that uh, existed well before the internet. It really doesn't apply to the internet. 
And you can look to other jurisdictions. You can look to the next door neighbor, Chile. You can look to the U.S. and the Communications Decency Act and see where companies really can take safe harbor so that the real perpetrators, if there are any, of, of what appear to be uh, these crimes or violations of law are the ones that are targets, not the Yahoo's and Google's who are the publishers. What we don't want to see at the end of the day is the withdrawal of companies like Yahoo and Google from a market like Argentina. There is great benefit for Argentine citizens in having access to information. There's great benefit in them having the communications tools that a Yahoo Argentina, for example, would offer. And this again goes back to our foundational belief that technology is incredibly empowering. It's a good and we would love to continue to offer it in markets around the world. Gentlemen, we are out of time. This conversation could go on, but Michael Samway of Yahoo, thank you for uh, being on the program today. Thank you. We've also been joined by Julian Sanchez with Ars Technica. Uh, it's a website that deals with technology issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm the, I'm the uh, uh, token political guy. Uh, ArsTechnica.com. He serves as their Washington editor. And to both of you, thanks for being on The Communicators. Thank you.